Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to our webinar, our last seminar in current semester, Actualité Critique Européenne. I would like to thank especially Professor Miklos Hadas from Corvinus University of Budapest for accepting our invitation. I'm very happy to welcome you to his lecture entitled Pierre Bourdieu and the, the diversity of habitus. Just two technical informations. Please turn off your microphones and cameras. And for your information, this conference is recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel. My name is Kinga Torbicka, and I am the research fellow at the Center for French Culture and Francophone Studies at the University of Warsaw. At the beginning, I will present our guest, then Miklos Hadash will hold a lecture, and afterward, we invite you to a debate with our guest. You could write your comments and questions on the chat also. Now, let me present our guest, Professor Miklos Hadash. You are a student, a former student of Pierre Bourdieu. You are a professor of sociology and former head of the Culture and Communication Doctoral School and founder and co-director of the Center for Gender and Culture at Corvinus University of Budapest. You are also a member of the Sociological Committee of the Hungarian Academy of Science. And you are a member of the Advisory Board of International Journal of Masculinity Studies. And you are the author of numerous articles on gender and masculinity. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation. Today's class will be devoted to the 20th anniversary of Pierre Bourdieu's death and of, of his heritage. Pierre Bourdieu theorizing has become a major focus for exploration within sociology. His work and that of Michel Foucault, famous French philosopher, is amongst the most frequently cited of the late 20th century, social, social theorists. New generations of researchers have continued to look to him and his uh, research. Professor Miklos Hadas will present today the Bordesian concept of habitus. It denotes a system of durable and trans transposable dispositions, which integrating all past experiences, functions, and every moment as a matrix of perceptions, appreciations, and actions, and makes it possible to accomplish infinitely differentiated tasks. The great French sociologists apply four conceptual strategies to capture the relations between changing social structures and dispositions, which will be presented by Professor Miklos Hadas. Please, Professor, the screen is yours. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. And um, I would like to say that I'm really honored to be in this position. And I'm very sorry that I can't be personally in Poland because I do like to be in Poland. I like very much this country. And I hope prior uh, to this event that I would be able to come today to Warsaw. But unfortunately, pandemic um, uh, did not allow to do so. Let me say uh, some words about myself, um, which was not mentioned by um, uh, Kinga Torbiska uh, in um, her um, introductory words. Um, I used to work at the Corvinus University of Budapest um, because last year, uh, in protest um, of uh, the reorganization of the university uh, and the placement of uh, oligarch loyal to Viktor Orban, the Hagendian prime minister, uh, in 
the university's leading pro, uh, positions, um, uh, I decided to leave the university. So I do uh, uh, not belong anymore to Corvinus University of Budapest, although that I taught there for um, uh, 35 years. Uh, that is my first uh, remark. Second, um, that I recently published a book, uh, and partly my talk will be based on this book, um, entitled Outlines of a Theory of Habit of Plural Habitus, Bourdieu Revisited. It was recently published by Rutledge edition in uh, English. Um, and uh, I would like to rethink certain elements of the Bourdieusian uh, conceptual framework in this book. And finally, uh, as you could hear, uh, I am uh, uh, a representative of the studies of, uh, on men and masculinities. Uh, and in this respect, I have a good news and a bad news. The good news is that I am the best expert of uh, the studies on men and masculinities in Hungary. The bad news is that there is no other <laughs> expert of these studies, um, so you have to be careful um, with uh, me if I would like to overestimate uh, myself. <clears throat> okay, um, let me say something about Bourdieu himself, because um, precisely 20 years ago, on the 25th of January, died Pierre Bourdieu, who is even 20 years after his death, is the most often referred sociologist in the world. It is a huge merit, uh, and I'm very happy that uh, I was a pupil in, of Bourdieu in the mid 80s in Paris, um, and um, I'm a witness that. Um, his oeuvre is a real common sociological treasure for all of us. Um, and it is one of the most stimulating um, and complex theoretical directions ever in our discipline. So um, I really feel happy. Uh, to be his um, uh, pupil, because when I was in Paris and when he was in uh, in, my, in the position of, uh, of the director de thèse, uh, I had a feeling that uh, I am near to a genius. He was really a genius, a sociological and a human genius. Um, so I uh, I am really appreciate um, uh, his work. However, I will not produce. Uh, actually a kind of um, epigon-like um, exegetical discourse on Bourdieu. Um, I will have critical remarks on him uh, and I will have critical remarks on his um, habitus theory. Although uh, I would like to underline that um, I have tried to adapt um, a path which, uh, or that um, is a prolongation proper of the one, of the path um, he had taken towards the end of his life. So in a certain sense, I uh, am standing on the shoulders of Bourdieu uh, while I try in certain respect um, uh, criticizing him. Okay, uh, here you can see uh, the structure of my talk. Uh, it is a very simple uh, tripartite uh, uh, structure. First, uh, I will try to define the habitus term, although uh, that I think that most of you are familiar with the term, but I think and I hope that I will be able to, uh, to add uh, something to your previous knowledge as far as um, the definition of habitus concept um, is concerned. Second, I will make some critical comments on the Bourdieusian use of this concept. Um, and finally, um, I will speak about uh, approaches, including my one, my book, um, um, uh, which, 
tries to deal with the diversity and plurality of um, the habitus. So um, you might <clears throat> see uh, here the definition of habitus, um, which was part of um, my abstract too. That is a well-known definition, uh, namely that habitus is a system of durable and transposable dispositions, which integrating- I'm sorry, Miklos Hadash, but we don't see the, your screen. We see only the first one. Okay, you don't see, uh-huh. Um, well, I try to um, re- Start. What are you seeing right now? Now it's okay. We see the fact, yes, now we see the uh, habitus You see definition. the habitus definition, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can read, you can follow uh, the written version of my talk, although that um, I will add several things to my written text. So habitus is defined by Pierre Bourdieu, a system of durable and transpos transposable dispositions which functions at every moment as a matrix of perceptions, appreciations, and actions. So that is um, the most important element of the habitus definition. Um, and um, as you may know, uh, the functioning of habitus is often explained by the metaphor of uh, sense of the game by uh, Pierre Bourdieu. What do we mean by this um, uh, metaphor? We can also use the metaphor of musical sense. Um, uh, these terms refer uh, to certain situations um, when, for instance, a musician invents a cadence um, or starts to improvise, uh, he or she automatically activates his incorporated musical dispositions, which might uh, be identified as stylistic conventions. Um, and these improvisations are based on many tens of thousands of hours of training repetitions, repetitive training. The sense of um, the game, the sense of football, uh, the sense of the ball is the same. When, for instance, uh, Lewandowski kicks the ball, this action, this very action is also based on tens of thousands of hours um, um, trainings and repetitive practice. And as a result of this repetitive practice, um, uh, we have automatisms um, and we uh, participate in uh, non-intentional, non-reflected actions. In other words, and simply speaking, the habitus term refers to incorporated, non-intentional, non-reflected, durable dispositional patterns. As you may also know, uh, by using the concept, um, Bourdieu intended to take a stand against several paradigms. He was not the first one who introduced the term. Classics, such as uh, Emil Durkheim, uh, Max Weber, um, Norbert Elias, um, also used the term. But uh, Pierre Bourdieu was the first one who emphasized and uh, theoretically legitimated the importance of the term. And he introduced the term against several other authors. First of all, against the structuralist anthropology of Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, the founder 
of um, the structuralist anthropology, and also against the so-called deterministic sociology of Louis Althusser, um, claiming that both reduced agents to simple carriers of the structure. So uh, they miss this mediating element, this mediating uh, elements. He also calls uh, the so-called orientalizing perspective of the anthropological gaze and the atomistic approach of social psychology. But first and foremost, um, he targeted in his critique the so-called individualist finalism of economic approaches, and first of all, the rational choice theory, which, based on the image of Homo economicus, economicus interpreted social practice as um, an interest-driven, goal-oriented, profit maximizing. This is the context of, uh, of uh, the introduction of uh, the habitus term. And let me say, uh, or let me emphasize or underline three elements um, or deep, if you want, the epistemological significance of the concept. Habitus suggests, the concept of habitus suggests that social praxis is not only a rational, action, but uh, is based and arise from non-conscious, non-reflexive <clears throat> drives. When we speak about habitus, we should think of impulses, feelings, senses, urges, or proclivities. <clears throat> Second, it is a mediating category, implying that there is no direct link between social structures and social actions. That was the target of his critique concerning um, Lévi-Strauss um, and Althusser. So habitus mediates, theoretically mediates between structure and action. Uh, if you want, um, uh, it is a kind of uh, um, um, strategy to resolve the so-called micro-macro Link, which is one of the uh, most important problems um, uh, of sociological theorizing. And finally, this term is also important um, because um, this mediating element um, illustrates that habitus might uh, be transferred from one area of practice to another area of practice. So habitus is present in all life spheres or in all spheres, in all fields. Um, and um, I think it is also a very important um, element uh, of the term. Well, we should know, and sometimes it is confused in the literature, and there are several authors who do not make a clear difference between habitus and identity. But we should make a difference between the two because habitus is not the same as identity. Because as I have mentioned earlier, as well, it uh, denotes consciously assumed and usually declared elements of social practice, um, indicating national, religious, occupational, territorial, etc., dimensions of social embeddedness. And we should also distinguish between dispositional and rational action. Habitus does refer only to dispositional action, but this fact does not exclude that in social reality, they are rational actions. In a certain sense, all of us are 
both rational and dispositional uh, actors, both rational and, um, and both goal-oriented and non-goal-oriented persons. So we should refer to the dispositional aspect um, of uh, the social action. And here you can find an other uh, terrible quotation, namely that habitus is a structuring, structured structure. It sounds uh, awful, but um, I don't think that it, uh, it is so difficult to understand uh, this definition, that the habitus is a structured structure. It means that our dispositions, our incorporated um, automatisms are conditioned, determined by our social background. If we are peasants, if we are um, offsprings of a middle-class family, this surrounding, this embeddedness will structure our behavior, will structure our dispositions. And what does uh, the structuring structure part of the definition means? It means simply that our habitus, our automatisms structure the practice. When uh, Lewandowski kicks the balls, he structures the practice. He does um, a certain kind of activity and this activity can be observed, can be um, uh, distinguished and classified by other actors and um, uh, this is part of um, the social universe which uh, surrounds us. So Bourdieu also says in this definition, which is from Distinction, uh, Distinction was published in French in 1979. 1979. Uh, there are two English translations since, um, and I think um, this is his um, Opus Magnum, his most important uh, uh, book. Um, so he also writes that these habitus, um, these structuring, structure, structure, are objectively harmonized and objectively orchestrated. In other words, the Bourdieu's habitus is usually homogeneous, um, a homogeneous entity, uh, and the homogeneity is uh, defined on a plus basis. Okay. That was the first part of my talk. Um, I do hope that more or less that this is more or less clear. What um, what is the meaning of um, of this term? Let me have some critical remarks um, on the Bourdieuian use of the uh, habitus concept. <clears throat> The first quotation is from masculine domination. Masculine domination, um, La Domination Masculine uh, is the original title, was uh, published in French in uh, 1998. Uh, uh, it is one of his last books, uh, and it is his most successful um, uh, books, uh, which was uh, published in more than 100,000 copies, which is a stellar number uh, in case of a social scientific publications. So in Masculine Domination, he writes that um, uh, these positions are inseparable from the structures that produce and reproduce them. It is quite obvious. If, and it logically follows, that as structures change, so do these positions. And if the structure remains unchanged, the habitus also remains unchanged. Logically speaking, that's what we have to expect from um, Bourdieu. And all you expect on the basis of the Bourdieuian definition. However, uh, the life is more complicated and the Bourdieuian sociology uh, is um, a little bit contradictory in this respect. Because after uh, scanning the whole oeuvre from the beginning, 
which was at the end of the 1950s until the end of his career um, at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, I could identify four conceptual strategies uh, from Bourdieu. In other words, um, he used um, um, four techniques uh, to tackle the problem of the um, uh, structure action um, uh, relation. The first was ignorance. Interestingly enough, in distinction, in his Opus Magnum, <clears throat> he theorized about the change in the social structure, but simply ignored any kind of discussion about changes in habitus. It was uh, consequently ignored in, uh, in this book. Um, he elaborated in, um, in distinction um, a so-called uh, theory about the changing social structure. It is identified as the translational reproduction of social structure, according to which all social groups uh, move into the same direction and, uh, and they uh, uh, have the same distance um, even uh, after uh, decades. So although Bourdieu uh, speaks about um, social transformation, he ignores uh, the problem of changing of habitus in his Opus Magnum. In masculine domination, he, that is his second strategy, second conceptual strategy, he introduces the permanence in change model, according to which he explicitly states that institutions change, but dispositions remain unchanged. In other words, and that is the main thesis of masculine domination, the gap between the genders in the long run um, is, um, is standard. There is a, a standard gap. <clears throat> uh, men and women are separated uh, from the same distance in the long run um, from each other other. And interestingly, um, he states in the book um, that dispositions remain unchanged and masculine domination is um, a universal phenomena which um, uh, can be observed in the long run from the Middle Ages until the end of the 20th century. Uh, I don't think that um, this claim is defendable. I've written um, on the long-term transformation of the grand order, and especially on the long-term transformation of masculine dispositions. Um, and I try to prove that um, uh, Bourdieu's permanence in change model is wrong, not only wrong, but logically incoherent. His third strategy, which is mainly used at the beginning of his career, in the early 60s, 1960s, when he writes about Algeria and Béarn, Béarn is the region where he was born in southern France. It's a poor region um, near the Spanish um, uh, border uh, with a special local dialect. So when he writes about this peasant universe, he introduces two very interesting terms, hysteresis and Don Quixote effect. And these terms refer to crisis situations where um, these normal functioning uh, have become dysfunctional because a lack of consensus um, between um, the inherited habitus 
and the altered constraints and expectations during social transformation. So uh, the history overpasses human beings. Um, for instance, when an old man in uh, his or her 60s or 70s um, is unable to apply new uh, techniques uh, of, um, of um, uh, communication, how to use an Android, for instance, um, while a six years old kid um, is easily uh, treats this kind of problem. Um, the old man, the old person, nobody might be labeled as someone who is uh, um, a representative of the Don Quixote effect because the technical development, the society uh, overpassed his or her competencies or dispositional awarenesses. And the fourth strategy, which is the most important in all our context, is when he introduces new terms such as primary, secondary, or cleft habitus to identify the diversity of dispositional patterns. But um, unfortunately, uh, these are only sporadic texts, um, especially in um, Pascalian meditations, La Les Meditations Pascalienne, uh, one of his um, latest books written in the 1990s, um, where <clears throat> he uh, is uh, introducing these terms. Um, so, um, how can I <clears throat> sum up my critical remarks on the Bourdieuian habitus concept? Um, first, as I have mentioned, in the universe of Bourdieu sociology, the habitus is usually a homogeneous entity, not a plural or, or um, changing entity, except certain uh, texts written towards the end of the career. Second point, Bourdieu overemphasizes the importance of class position and underemphasizes the age gender, regional, occupational, spatial dimensions of the habitus. Because I think that there, there is a gender habitus. The habitus is also dependent on the age. The habitus is also dependent on the occupation, on spatial position, and so on and so forth. And Bourdieu does not reflect systematically on these dimensions of the habitus, but overemphasizes um, the class dimension of the term. Third element, in my opinion, the bodily dimensions, the, uh, the term incorporation refers to this bodily dimension, uh, are not sophisticated enough. The Bourdieuian agent has no biological needs, no emotions, no passions, no spiritual experiences. The Bourdieuian agent does not feel shame, does not grow old or experience faithful loves or friendships. So um, this is the big difference between uh, Pierre Bourdieu and Norbert Elias, who uh, in a revolutionary manner, even in the 1930s, in his opus magnum on the civilizing, on the process of civilization, he takes into account these elements, biological needs, emotions, passions, shame, age, love, and so on and so forth. So there is a chance to widen the scope, the horizon um, of the habitus term. And finally, Bourdieu does not study long-term historical processes, or if so, it is really problematic as in the case of masculine domination. <clears throat> but I would like to emphasize that uh, he has elaborated excellent concept. Hysteresis, Don Quixote effect, primary, secondary, or cleft habitus um, um, were introduced by uh, Bourdieu in the late 1990s. 
And around the turn of the millennium, in his lectures um, at the Collège de France, uh, uh, he often emphasized, uh, uh, and he often used these terms. For instance, he has a posthumous book on money uh, based on his lectures um, in 2000 um, um, at the Collège de France, um, where he employs and applies um, uh, the cleft habitus <clears throat> term as far as uh, money is concerned. So I'm convinced that had he not been prevented um, um, from uh, doing so by his relatively early death uh, uh, 20 years ago, he would have continued uh, to subject the phenomenon of differentiated habitus to a more systematic investigation. And it is really a great loss for our science uh, that he could not develop these analyses further. But they are colleagues, um, they are theories um, uh, who concentrate um, on these terms. But prior to refer to these uh, theories and concepts, um, uh, let me show you a quotation uh, from uh, Bourdieu. Um, uh, it is from Esquisse pour une auto-analyse. Um, um, uh, it is also a posthumous uh, book. Uh, uh, the English title is Sketch for a Self-Analysis, when he writes about his cleft habitus. Uh, and cleft habitus is defined by Bourdieu as a kind of coincidence of contraries uh, between um, different uh, factors. <clears throat> and he identifies a strong discrepancy between high academic consecration and low social origin. And this discrepancy um, is, um, is labeled, um, or this is the structural um, um, conditioning factor of the emergence of his cleft um, habitus. Okay, so let me uh, speak about um, some approaches um, that uh, concentrate on the diversity and plurality of um, the habitus. Um, first of all, I have to mention contemporary social mobility researches. In the last 10 years or so, there are thousands of papers in which uh, key terms such as cleft habitus, fragmented habitus, compartmentalized habitus are present, or I can continue chameleon habitus, destabilized, habitus, and so on and so forth. These researches, mainly in British social mobility researches, but not exclusively and not necessarily, um, are dealing with uh, the social mobility path of, uh, of university students of working class origin. The problem is evident. Someone is coming from um, um, a Manchester suburb, working class suburb, and go to the um, university where he or she uh, finds himself um, in a middle class um, surrounding. And in this context, the cleft habitus or chameleon or compartmentalized habitus um, is often used by different authors um, to identify this habitual or dispositional shift. Um, <clears throat> There are studies uh, within uh, the framework of migration studies, writing about um, Chinese immigrants in Australia, uh, Turkish uh, uh, in, uh, in Germany, and so on and so forth, using terms like transnational habitus, um, diversified habitus, and so on and so forth. Uh, so forth. So, in migration studies, um, the term can be used and is used um, by a lot of um, uh, authors. 
what I would like to say that in these texts, usually the cleft habitus is a little bit overemphasized. <clears throat> Fortunately, however, there are certain texts in which the authors argue that um, um, they, there are situations in which, uh, <clears throat> for instance, um, Turkish second generation migrants in Germany, there are situations uh, when uh, the second generation uh, uh, Turkish migrant who is a German citizen um, can internalize plural forms, plural dispositional forms. He or she has his dispositions uh, that can be activated or that function in dire uh, national Turkish surroundings um, in his or her family, but certain other dispositions when they are in a German um, occupational setting uh, can coexist with, uh, peacefully coexist with their primary uh, dispositional patterns. In other words, primary, secondary, or tertiary dispositional patterns can uh, peacefully coexist in certain situations. So, um, another important reference is um, Bernard Lair's work. Um, Bernard Lair is a Bourdieu's pupil um, who emphasizes the important nuances and fine-grained dimensions of individual dispositions, and he elaborates a sociology at the level of the individual. Uh, and one of his main slogans is that the singular is necessarily plural in nature. And he also claims that actors are multi-socialized and multi-determined. So he's a prolific uh, French act uh, author um, who who publishes not only in French, but uh, several uh, articles and books um, uh, of him are available uh, in English too. So actually in the, in the second or third decade of the 21st century, uh, there are thousands of texts published by excellent um, uh, social scientists uh, in which um, the plurality, changeability, transformability, um, uh, chameleon-like character um, or plurality or fragmented nature of uh, uh, habitus um, is uh, put on the agenda. And let me mention finally, some of um, my suggestions, uh, some further research topics um, that uh, were ignored by Pierre Bourdieu, uh, but uh, these research topics seem to be uh, extremely interesting uh, for me. And um, these uh, research topics might target the diversity of habitus. First of all, let me start um, with um, the issue of the long-term transformation and diversification of habitus. This is uh, the topic um, uh, that Norbert Elias, uh, my symbolic grandfather, if Pierre Bourdieu is my symbolic father, uh, Norbert Elias uh, is my symbolic grandfather, uh, put on the agenda. Uh, and his opus magnum, uh, what I've that I've mentioned uh, uh, on the process of civilization, might be interpreted as a kind of long-term um, analysis um, of uh, the long, as a kind of analysis of the long term transformation of habitus, or to use Elias' uh, concept, the, the long term transformation of social habitus. So, in my book, um, uh, 
there is a chapter about the long-term transformation of the gender order. And there is another chapter in which I try to interpret uh, the Norbert Eliasian um, um, opus magnum, the opus magnum of the process sociology as um, one of the founders uh, of the approaches uh, uh, targeting the issue of the diversity of habitus. A second uh, interesting research pro uh, project might be um, about the different dispositional dimension of plural habitus, such as gender, age, nationality. National habitus might be analyzed. Minority habitus might be also analyzed. Gender habitus is also an important and interesting issue because if we define gender as this position, and I try to do that, um, I think that um, we have huge uh, horizons uh, that um, uh, um, are opening. The third topic is also very interesting, the transitional forms between plural and cleft habitus. How can we distinguish between, how can we make the distinction between plural and cleft habitus? Um, also an interesting issue, the study of multicultural embeddedness. It is completely ignored by Bourdieu. In uh, the 21st century, there are hundreds of million with multiple mother tongues. There are hundreds uh, or, or tens of millions who belong to the third culture kids category or globally mobile um, uh, persons. Um, and I think that um, in this um, context, um, we can also try to use um, this term. Uh, another issue might be the transgender and queer habitus. Uh, when gender is transformed, or queer habitus, when gender is, um, is uh, transitory and changing and, and is a kind of performative um, activity, I think that um, we have a lot to say if we try to use um, um, uh, the, uh, the plural habitus um, or diverse habitus uh, uh, term. Similarly, transitional I, uh, areas between identity and habitus, between dispositional and rational actions uh, are also very interesting issues. And I, uh, I plan uh, to do, uh, to deal with these kind of um, uh, problems. And another issue which is not uh, taken into account by Bourdieu is um, the problem of <clears throat> habitus inculcation. Because I think there are different types and there are different institutions of the habitus inculcations. There are religious communities, there are military um, or sports institutions. In this context, um, we will internalize different um, forms. We will inculcate different forms um, of um, habitus. The, in other words, we can make a distinction between duration, form, and extent of habitus inculcation. And we can uh, confront total disposition drill with partial disposition drill. <clears throat> what does that mean? If I speak about total disposition drill, the term can be applied to vocations in which varying uniform is mandatory. So priests, police, soldiers um, uh, are um, subject um, of a kind of total disposition drill. But um, we can distinguish this total disposition deal from partial disposition deal. For instance, um, a medieval knight uh, um, subordinates himself to the uh, lord. 
he fulfills his duties of vassalage. But when he has a, when he is away, he can give vent to the drives of his uncivilized libido dominandi. So he can um, exert a kind of dispositional relaxation. It is also an interesting term, dispositional relaxation. For instance, young IT specialist um, drinking habits at the weekend uh, or practice of extreme sports uh, um, uh, when techno middle class technocrats go um, to um, um, to bungee jumping uh, or um, or paddling um, uh, on wide waters uh, and so on and so forth. These activities, if we put it into this dispositional context, might be labeled as um, dispositional relaxations. Another issue, which is not taken into account by Bourdieu, is the interrelation between life cycles and habits. In our life, there, there are rites of passage. We have a diploma. We, um, we become father, mother. We lose uh, our parents. We receive um, a cancer diagnosis, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> we have a new diploma. We will become sociologists. So uh, life cycles might exert an influence on the habitus uh, in the long run. Uh, we are not the same as old men as a young man. Anyway, in the introduction of my book, uh, I write about my plural habitus, um, distinguishing between different um, factors, different aspects of my family embeddedness, um, middle class mother and lover middle class father. And I try to argue that um, I could um, incorporate um, uh, easily and um, and um, luckily uh, diverse um, forms of dispositions from my family, but during my life uh, path, during my life cycles, when I became a father, or um, uh, when I became a more or less old man, uh, I had to realize that my dispositions has changed, and so on and so forth. Uh, forth. Okay, and uh, finally, I would like to tell you that actually, I, um, I try to concentrate on two research topics. Um, the first one is the social construction of libido academica. Libido academica is a term introduced by Pierre Bourdieu, uh, referring to this um, um, unconscious, unreflected drive that we academics um, take part in academic life. But if we go a little bit further, and if we would like to understand, or if we would like to have a deeper understanding of academic existence, um, I think we can make distinctions between different forms of, um, of uh, libido academica. And in this respect, I think age is a very important uh, factor, uh, but gender can also be an important factor if you would like to understand uh, and study uh, the dispositions of uh, an um, academic and the social construction of these dispositions. And finally, um, I plan to do uh, a research on the minority habitus. As you may know, um, in the neighboring countries, which, which, uh, which are neighbors of Hungary, um, Romania, Slovakia, Ukraine, um, Serbia, Croatia, Austria, they are ethnic Hungarians. <clears throat> so I would like to, millions of ethnic Hungarians, um, and I would like to make a research um, on uh, the plural dispositions of ethnic Hungarians living 
for instance, in Slovakia and Romania, uh, concentrating on three different life dimensions of, of these ethnic minorities. Um, first, um, relations um, uh, within their ethnic community in their local uh, city with other Hungarians. Second, relations with the majority Romanians or Slovakians in um, their home country, Slovakia or Romania. And third, dire dispositional variations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, <clears throat> Hungarians living in Hungary. Because I have uh, several experiences that um, these dispositions um, uh, in minority settings are contextually defined. And an ethnic Hungarian in Slovakia is a different um, uh, person in his ethnic community, in his um, uh, uh, country in a, in a, with a Slovak or Romanian majority or uh, in a Hungarian uh, um, community in Hungary. Okay, so you can see um, there are a lot of issues uh, to be studied, um, concentrating on um, uh, the plurality and diversity um, of habitus. And as a kind of conclusion, I would like to tell you um, that I'm convinced that it is no coincidence that 20 years after his death, Bourdieu is still the most cited author in our discipline. And I repeat, I keep on repeating that despite my critical stance, I have accepted several elements of Bourdieu's conceptual framework, and I have adopted a path that constitutes a prolongation proper of the one he had taken towards the end of his life. And finally, I would be delighted to find Polish colleagues or students who are willing uh, to take part in research on the plurality and diversity of habitus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Miklos Hadash, for your very interesting lecture on the Pierre Bourdieu heritage and for explaining us your perspective, uh, your perception of the habitus of Pierre Bourdieu. Uh, please, now it's a time for question and answer session. You could write your question or comments on the chat or ask directly to Professor Miklos Hadash. Please to okay, be free. you are welcome. Yes, you are welcome and we invite you to ask the question. It is a very exceptional occasion to ask your question to Professor Miklos Hadash. So maybe I will start. I am not the specialist on the Pierre Bourdieu because I am the specialist on the security, European security in, in Europe. But I would like to ask you, what do you think does the pandemic change the perception of the habitus and maybe change the dispositions that you mentioned on your uh, presentation? Well, it's a good question. Um, uh, well, <clears throat> um, I'm really grateful uh, to you because um, your question um, uh, help me uh, to point out um, that uh, dispositional changes uh, cannot be identified on the short run. So uh, we can't say that uh, last year um, um, our life was determined by this awful pandemic. Um, and next year, um, our dispositions um, will be different. But I think that um, in the medium run and in the long run, I think um, that uh, 
these kind of events, these kind of pandemics uh, might exert um, an influence um, on our dispositions. What um, can I imagine? Namely, that um, new automatisms, new behavioral patterns um, can be internalized via the, so via the so socialization process. Uh, uh, our uh, relation uh, with the nature, uh, our relation to each other, our patterns, um, uh, how to behave, uh, how to inhabit the space, um, how to take control uh, of um, our physical presence um, might be influenced in the medium run. So I can imagine that in a family, in schools, kids are um, educated uh, to take a distance. Kids are educated to respect the nature. Keep, kids are educated to take into account um, certain elements on the basis of which um, we can uh, live in a world in which sustainable development um, in the largest sense of the term is a key element. And if during the socializing process, during a decade or during decades, these elements um, uh, are present, I think that the pandemic uh, will influence, uh, will exert a kind of influence um, um, on our dispositions. Anyway, I think that um, this, uh, this is a very interesting research topic, anyway. Um, and I think that there is a, a, <clears throat> a huge gap between generations. For instance, um, my son, who is, um, uh, who is a university student um, and um, studies sustainable development, um, uh, the fact itself that uh, a young man in Europe um, chooses to study sustainable development and um, he, uh, his relation to nature, to the nature in general, is, uh, is um, I don't want to say that completely, but significantly different of my uh, relation uh, to, to the nature. And I think that um, our father-son relationship um, might be a good indicator of this generational gap, an incorporated generational gap um, as a structural constraint of uh, the changing social and cultural relation to the nature and to each other, and so on and so forth. So it is a very interesting and important question. And the main point is that um, if we bear in mind that these positions uh, function in the medium and the long run, um, interesting researches might be um, uh, formulated and done. Thank um, you very much, Professor. I think we have one question from Professor Marta Buchholz, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you and uh, hello, Miklos, and it's such a pleasure. Oh, to nice to see you, Marta. You. And uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. And the, my question would be, well, as you are aware, I'm currently uh, leading a project on national habitus in Poland. Yeah, and I, I in this project, uh, well, we are studying various uh, variants, so to say, or designs of Polish national habitus. And what we have found out, well, uh, it's not uh, utterly surprising still, it's interesting, I think, is that there are cases in which national habitus is 
actively defend it against what you what I would call following uh, your work a pluralization of habitus. One example from the from the work of uh, uh, my supervisee, who is unfortunately not with us at the moment, uh, Paweł Bagiński, is uh, the uh, he called it rainbow patriotism. This would be LGBT plus persons who are demonstrating their patriotic stance and their adherence to Polish national values, mm -hmm. and of course. This is met with huge resistance from heteronormative Polish patriots, so to say, who are of an opinion that the rainbow and the Polishness do not somehow go together. Mm -hmm. So there would be two questions to follow up on this. First one would be, what would be your opinion about the theoretical limits of compatibility of plural habitus? So, how would you set forth an agenda for studying the conditions for uh, the impossibility to bring certain habitus together? And the second question would be, well, uh, would you say that the pluralization of habitus or the realization of the plurality of habitus, more accurately speaking, would in fact lead to, uh, lead to more reflexivity in our self-perception as careers of certain habitus. If I am currently aware that my habitus as a Polish patriot, a heteronormative Polish patriotic woman can be shared by a person who is not heteronormative, who is very different from me, but at the same time, a very same kind of person in a way, does it contribute to my uh, reflexivity rising, so to say, and the reflexivity of my habitus, per consequence rising, or does it contribute to a different construction of habitus that would be more exclusive, that would in fact actively defend others from joining me in my, in this case, national habitus? So that would be my question and thank you again. Okay, uh, I'm not sure uh, whether I will be able to give you um, um, a correct answer, uh, because uh, your questions are extremely difficult, uh, and uh, and um, well, um, first of all, uh, what I would like to say that uh, I myself, as you know, um, have written something on the Hungarian national habitus, um, and the. the uh, <clears throat> The title of the paper is uh, The Culture of Distrust. And uh, I, I, I try to identify uh, a kind of common denominator uh, of the Hungarian national habitus. But in this paper, um, I um, have not concentrated on the plurality and diversity uh, of the habitus because my focus, my perspective was on this common denominator. Uh, and, um, well, uh, why I say that? Because I think that um, uh, the main element of my answer that everything is depends on the perspective. What I would like to uh, understand, what I would like to study, what uh, am I interested in? I'm uh, looking for uh, the elements of this uh, common denominator or I would like to concentrate um, uh, on, uh, on the variations, on plurality, on contradictions um, uh, within my targeted uh, topic. Um, and in, if uh, we accept that the second strategy is also legitimate, um, uh, I think that there is no contradiction um, uh, between um, uh, uh, different, uh, no theoretical contradiction, uh, that um, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, Polish national habitus uh, might exist. Um, on the basis of one, um, the rainbow uh, elements uh, should be excluded. But uh, on the basis of the other uh, type of habitus, um, um, Polishness, uh, Polishness um, can be identified uh, with uh, the elements of LGBTQ uh, rainbow uh, factors. 
how can we um, solve these kind of uh, seeming contradictions or problems? Well, if we use the um, uh, Eliophian method, namely we put our issue into a historical context and we try to concentrate on the historical transformation of a certain unit um, of my um, uh, targeted um, uh, topic. Uh, and <clears throat> I, um, I keep on emphasizing that um, historical thinking um, is um, a must. Um, and uh, if we accept that historical thinking, um, on the basis of historical thinking, we will produce um, different subunits um, uh, in our you know, research topics. I think uh, that uh, <clears throat> we can um, make a kind of uh, <clears throat> peaceful coexistence between uh, different um, subtypes <clears throat> uh, of the national habitus, or we can reformulate um, our, um, um, our claims, uh, namely <clears throat> that uh, the national habitus as such, uh, the Polish habitus um, is as such, is a diversified, historically constructed, historically changing, um, 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 topic or issue, um, and these uh, transformations are um, par excellence uh, part of the very research um, topic. As for um, um, uh, the self-reflexivity and, uh, and the comparative um, element um, of uh, the plural habitus approach, um, I think uh, <clears throat> that, uh, <clears throat> again, my answer lies in uh, emphasizing um, um, the importance of historicity and uh, if we try to apply similar um, historical analytical units, um, namely, we will concentrate on uh, the distinctions and similarities between um, Polish, and Hungarian uh, middle-class um, gender dispositions in the 19th century. So we have a time dimension, we, we have a social dimension, we have a class uh, dimension, we have a gender dimension, and we try to compare uh, the position and disposition of Polish and Hungarian peasant women in the early 19th century, in that case, I think that we will be able to organize and, uh, and realize a kind of um, relevant uh, um, um, uh, research um, about uh, uh, comparative research um, about two subtypes of um, um, the national habitus. Uh, <clears throat> and as for self-reflection, I think that, um, and in this respect, I, I follow Pierre Bourdieu, uh, and um, I say that I, as a social scientist, as a sociologist, um, uh, I can, or I would even say I should try uh, to make the social analysis. And um, I should try to reflect on myself. Anyway, uh, in Bourdieu's uh, sketch uh, for a self-analysis, um, he fails to be 
uh, uh, relevant and a clear-minded uh, uh, researcher on himself, and because sometimes he produces apologetic um, and um, uh, surprisingly um, biased um, arguments. But in principle, uh, self-reflexivity as a kind of methodological tool of uh, the social scientific thinking uh, should be a relevant uh, method in order uh, to concentrate on ourselves. When I try to uh, reconstruct or deconstruct uh, uh, the social construction of the libido academica, uh, I try to do my best following the Bourdieuian ideal, namely that I objectify myself as a researcher, as a researcher, as a historically conditioned researcher in a, in a certain age period. I take into account my gender. I take into account my class position as a sociologist, and I try to generalize um, that a certain social scientist in a given uh, gender, class, um, age, uh, nationality uh, position will uh, represent um, certain given dispositional traits. So, in other words, um, I think that um, <clears throat> even that Bourdieu was unable uh, to practice uh, um, self uh, analysis or social analysis correctly, um, the method as such, um, self-reflexivity um, is a useful tool for all of us, for all of us social scientists, students of social sciences, uh, if we want uh, to make uh, uh, researches, because I think um, that um, we should see uh, the limits of our embeddedness um, and uh, we should be able to identify our standpoints. In this respect, uh, I follow um, the strategy of the standpoint feminism saying that um, we have to, we always have to define our um, position as a knowledge producer prior to start any kind of research. So um, this is an epistemological condition of the objective um, approach. In this respect, um, I, uh, I follow Donna Haraway, who is a brilliant, um, uh, brilliant um, uh, feminist epistemologist and, and philosopher of science. Okay, so uh, shortly, um, I think uh, that um, historicity uh, is the main condition of um, uh, of uh, uh, the relevant uh, of making a relevant comparative uh, research um, and. Uh, Plurality uh, should be uh, studies if we uh, suppose that national habitus, if we concentrate, we, if we do not concentrate on the common denominator of uh, the national habitus, but on the local um, and dispositional variations, um, or if you want, sub-dimensions. Um, the identified sub-dimensions of the national habitus should also be taken into account. So if I study Polish habitus, I have to distinguish between masculine, feminine, middle class, lower class, uh, 
southern, northern, urban, etc., uh, etc. Et factors. Um, and in this case, we will have a diversified, pluralized, historically conditioned image about the permanent transformation of uh, the national habitats. Okay. Well. Thank you very much. Is there is some another questions to Professor Miklas Hadash? Students, I would like to, to hear students' question. I would really, I'd be really happy if uh, some of the students um, could uh, raise any kind of questions, even critical questions or comments or yes. <laughs> personal uh, narratives um, uh, can also be interesting for all of us. I, I do know that there are maybe to start maybe. speaking if uh, the professors um, uh, have the monopoly to speak, but um, maybe some brave student um, will um, um, prove uh, that I'm wrong. Hmm. I think they are a little intimidated by you, so... <laughs> I don't want to intimidate. No, 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 I don't. <laughs> Do you think that I'm, I'm, I'm an, look like an intimidator? No, <laughs> not at all. I, think, uh, no, I don't want to be, and I, I, I do hope that I don't look like as an intimidator. I'm a friendly people. I'm a friendly person. <laughs> so if, if there is no question, maybe we will stop there. And I think I hope that we will see next time, maybe personally in person in Warsaw. Yes. So I do hope it. I am really happy. I would be really happy. <laughs> Yes, we also and I see faces and eyes, uh, whether you are interested in or you are boring, bored, or what do you think? So um, I, I don't really like to to speak and to uh, uh, to be somewhere in the nowhere because I, yes, I see I know. Kinga's face and Marta's face um, uh, a few minutes earlier. Yes, so I hope that the next time it will be in in person in Warsaw at the University of Warsaw. One time pandem pandemic will be end. So thank you very much, Professor Miklas Hadac, for your lecture and very interesting presentation. And thanks a lot. Very much, all participants. Thank you. And I thank you. It was a pleasure for me to. Uh, and I do hope that we will have the occasion to meet personally. Mm. Yes, it was a real pleasure for us and also to meet Professor Marta Bocholt. So thank you very much. And I uh, hope uh, to see you again at the University of Warsaw. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.